Okay, so this is my commonplace book, final thing. Um, I figured I talk better and I can put things into words, so, so give me a chance to explain myself um, and why I chose the things I did. So I decided to talk about uh, three weeks that we discuss things that, to me, are very personal and I would that I think are imperative to bring into the classroom. Um, so we're gonna, I'm going to talk about week four, which was self, social, and moral development. I'm going to be, sorry, I just have my notes pulled up here. Week five, learner differences and learning needs. And week seven, cultural diversity, cultural and diversity in teaching and learning. Um, I chose these three specifically because I think as a teacher, these are things that we need to be aware of because they're not only going to affect our students within our classroom, but they're going to affect how they're going to affect their development and who they are as people for the rest of their lives. And as teachers, we are the we're the ones who help shape these students into the people they're going to become. Um, so I think that it's really important for us to be aware that we have that power and that we have that influence and make sure that we do right by these kids and not abuse it. So starting at week four, um, I'm just going to give a broad what we talked about and then why I think it's so important. Um, so week four, we did the Brenner bioecological model. We did Erickson's psycho psychosocial model of development and then power dynamics within peer groups. Um, more development and then looked at uh, Gilligan Kohlberg um, and the moral reasoning and ethic and, and ethic of care. Sorry. Um, so Brenner. So obviously I did my my group did our group essay on Brenner's bioecological model of development. So I we all agree that it's one of the most important things I think as a teacher we can learn about and learn how it influences and affects children. Um, so there's the th four systems or there's more there's five but we focus on four. So the microsystem, uh, your immediate relationships and activities. So parents, teachers, peers, uh, any ac any activities that you, the student is involved in, will this will help. These are like the most direct influences on a child, and this will help shape who they are the most. Um, so, as teachers, we are part of a child's microsystem. We can be there to set good examples. We, they spend majority of a child, like a child's developmental stage, they spend the majority of the time with a teacher in a classroom learning. We have to be able to set that a good example and make sure that they know what's right, what's wrong, and teach them and be there to guide them. Uh, so we have the meso system which is the relationships among components of microsystems. So it's the people who may not interact with a child in a, directly, but still have influences. So it'd be a parent interacting with a teacher. Uh, it could be the neighborhood that a child grew up in. All these things are gonna have influences on the child, though not directly. So for example, a teacher interacting with a parent when a child is struggling or they have concerns, these are all, this is part of the meso system. So while it might not directly involve the child, those communications are vital so that everyone knows what is going on with the student and everyone is on the same page in terms of the needs and what can be done to guide and help the student be the best they can. So then there's the exosystem, which is um, social structures um, of a child. So, like, religion and 
like social services, news, mass media is a big one, especially in our day and age. Um, social media is such an uh, inherent part of who we are now. We have our online identities. And as teachers, I think it's really important that we teach these students how to be safe and how to recognize that while being on social media is good, it can you can learn a lot of things. You can connect with people around the world. You can find out what's going on um, in China or Egypt or like new te new technological developments, new like just whatever you can find out what's happening anywhere in the world in a second and that's that's insane that's great you can find out about things that happened hundreds and hundreds of years ago and I think that's amazing that's incredible that we have all of this information at our disposal but saying that we also have to be aware that there's a lot of fake news out there I'm hesitant to use the word fake news because it's such a buzzword um but be aware that not everything we read is true and being aware that as media consumers we need to dig deep and be critical about what we're reading. So I think it's a teacher's duty to make sure that our students know that you can't just take everything at face value. Um, but you have, they have to be aware, be able to analyze bias and all that fun stuff. Um, and also, just being safe online, I think, is a big thing. With all the different social media platforms, cyberbullying, and all those things are are rising. Um, and students need to be aware that it's okay to take a step back and to, to be able to know that they can come and talk to you if they're concerned about something. Um, yeah. So then there's the macro system, which is the biggest influence. It kind of has everything around it. It's um, like beliefs, values. Basically, what your culture and the culture you grew up in believes, that's your macro system. And a lot of times um, that heavily influences a child because that's what their parents grew up with, their parents' parents. All of that is going to be influencing them. Um, yeah, so that's Brenner. And I think Brenner is one of the one of the most important things I think I learned this year. Uh, because I think it's so important to understand how each of these systems interact with one another and how each of these systems interact with the child. Because this is it. This is, this is our society. And our society shapes our children. So learning how to use, how to understand and how to use these systems is one of the most important things, I think. Um, um, yeah, we wanted to talk about ecological and individual approaches to development, but, like, I didn't think that was as important. Um, peer culture. Peer culture is something that I heavily believe in, because friends, your friends as a child and a teenager are the most important people to you. Um, and I think... For kids, knowing that you don't have to stay friends with someone if they make you feel like crap. If they, if you don't feel like you can like things because you'll get judged. And knowing how to recognize friends um, as like healthy friendships and non-healthy friendships is really important. And knowing that your friends... Like, whether you recognize it or whether they recognize it or not, friend groups are going to have, there's going to be, like, an unspoken set of rules, kind of conventions, cliques. Um, for me, cliques wasn't really a thing, but, I mean, each experience is different. But knowing that having someone that you can talk to and knowing that, like, a good friend group is, even if it's just one or two people, is something that I think students need. They need someone, they need people that they can surround themselves with. Um, but being aware as teachers that we have to keep an eye on friend groups, maybe, because they're not always the healthiest um, systems. Uh, just being aware, like, if we think we see bullying or something, or something that doesn't sit right, maybe just talking to a student. 
um, yeah, so just being aware of, well, I mean, as students, we're aware that we have, like, our peer cultures and cliques and groups, but as an educator, just being a little bit more aware of the consequences that can come with those groups, yeah. Ooh, go back. Ah! Sorry. Um... Oh, uh, the concept of exploring identity. Okay, identity is something that is huge. And I think teaching students that they don't have to be set an identity at any point in their life is a huge thing. It can seriously help self-esteem because, like, identity is a huge, huge concept. You don't have to pick one and stay with it for the rest of your life. Um, and keeping up with self-esteem just oh as educators I think we seriously can influence um, a student's self-esteem and I think it's our job to make sure that we're not bringing a student down or not crushing them we're, but that we're helping them helping raise their self-esteem and help helping them reach those goals however far and out of reach they may seem we can help a student do that so we can either crush a student or we can help them up and I think any any teacher that doesn't believe that it's their job to help bring a student to the highest they can be is in the wrong profession I I, how, I wholeheartedly believe that um, yeah uh, sorry, I'm looking at my notes right now um, Yeah. And then, like, aggression, understanding where it comes from and all that. But understanding where the aggression comes from and how that there is, like, peer aggression, which is... Um, peer aggression is a big thing that I think we don't realize how big it is. And a lot of times, it's microaggressions. Your friends aren't going to straight up come out and be like, oh, I hate you, or whatever. Because that's not subtle. That won't help them gain what they want. It's the microaggressions that we need to be aware of and help our students be aware of because those can be really detrimental. Detrimental, sorry, to a student's mind and self-esteem and self-worth. Um, yeah, okay. So that was week four. Um, cool. So, no, I don't want to do week seven yet. I want to do week five. Sorry. So week five was a really cool week for me, I thought. Uh, we had the, we had our guest come in. Um, Rhett Wallace. He was great. I loved him. He was so cool. Um, and I think he really, he really definitely spoke to what it's like to go through the education system with a disability and how our system is is it gotten better but it's still not where it could be in terms of helping those students with disabilities reach their potential um so we talked about language and labeling um as we said like labels have power and they do labels very very much have power power <laughs> um so Ah. You stay? Cool. Um, so like ableism, being aware that able that we're not using ableist terms, um, and just being aware that there are different like handicaps and disabilities will they manifest in different ways. And just being aware of that. Um, to let go of our bias as educators and be go into each new day each classroom with an open mind and an open perspective of all, all these students um yeah and especially it might not seem like a big thing but uh n using neutral language is a big thing that i think a lot of teachers could benefit from learning and i know it's like in our society gendered um language is so ingrained but neutral language 
can go a long way to helping a student prevail and to helping a student feel comfortable and safe within a classroom. Um, yeah, so we actually, yeah, we have it here. <laughs> every student, every situation is unique and requires a unique approach. This is 100% true. I wholeheartedly, I fully believe that. Every student is different and we need, we can't approach two students the same. One student might excel in written words, but another student might not be able to get their ideas across that way. And I think having those, those opportunities and the different options for a student to express themselves while staying within our curriculum outlines, obviously, is such an easy way to accommodate students. Um, yeah. Mm, talking about memory. Yeah. But, I don't know, memories, memory's not something I think is as important as just being aware of our language and being aware that everyone learns different, every student is going to be different, and we need to approach them and expect it like that. Yeah, so that was week five. Uh, so week six was culture and diversity in teaching and learning, and I think that is one of the biggest things as a teacher that we need to be aware of, the diversity of our classrooms, the diversity of backgrounds, of teaching, of whatever it is. No student is going to come, two students that can come with the same background could have completely different experiences. And I think we need to, and I, well, I know we need to be aware of that. Um, yeah, and like a culture, so like education, religious, all those beliefs are going to affect how a student will learn in your classroom. Um, yeah. Stereotypes. Being aware as teachers that our, that we there is going to be a power imbalance between us and our students. There, it's inherently there. We're the educator, they're the students. But we can do a lot to minimize that power imbalance by letting go of our, of our biases and any stereotypes that we have about students, about neighborhoods, about whatever. Leaving them at the door and not seeing a bunch of different student I'm not seeing like the race Ugh, that sounds weird but like not seeing the race the backgrounds just seeing students who all want to learn they're all there because they want to learn um prejudice and like leaving that stuff behind it does no one good to have those stereotypes and prejudice in a classroom all it does is deter the students from trying to learn and it makes the classroom a place that nobody wants to be um yeah. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, talked about oppression. Um, yeah, there's always gonna be. Well, our history. I'm a his. I don't want to be. A, I'm a history teacher. Our history is full of oppression, and being aware of that when we're teaching, and that some material is gonna be really sensitive for others, and just a approaching those topics and those students and just that whole thing with an air of caution but not skirting around what actually happened we have to be honest um or else things are never going to change um and being aware that change can start with us i think that's such a huge thing that change can start with us we can we can teach these kids to be better than we were and I think that's the goal as teachers, to teach them to be better than we were. Um, yeah, and like class, we talked about class. Class is gonna be a huge thing. There's gonna be students in your class who can afford anything. And there's gonna be students who are struggling to eat. Being aware of that and just doing what you can to help and make each of these children, each child, sorry, feel as if they belong in the classroom because they do each child that comes in our classroom belongs there they fit in and the classroom would not be the same without them making sure that they know that um ethnicity race all that like discrimination stuff um big thing for this of this week was the gender sex and sexual orientation uh that speaks really 
close to my heart. I do identify as non-binary and I know that going into a teaching profession is going, that's gonna be a challenge for me. Um, I know that. Oh, sorry Vince. <laughs> um, I know that's gonna be a challenge and I know the challenges that come with it. Um, and I think, and I know personally that that is gonna be something that I take with me into my classrooms. The belief, the idea that whoever you are, whatever you identify as, this is a safe space for you and you can change it. No, I, I don't believe in discrimination. I don't think anyone should. And I don't think, I don't believe in teachers that refuse to accommodate their, their students. Like, because especially in high school, that's already a really stressful time. Um, they don't need, our students don't need their teachers being being the ones that are dragging them down by not respecting pronouns, not by using homophobic language, by using all these things that have no place in a classroom. Keep your, like, I think if your views are negative, keep them outside the classroom. O only positivity, like, because these are things that are going to affect a child for the rest of their lives. Um, yeah. But I, and I also think, I also, like, teachers that are, like, oh, this kind of conversation doesn't belong in a classroom. I think this is the place where it does. In an academic, safe environment. Let's have this conversation. You want to talk about, like, sexual orientation? Let's do it. Let's talk about it. I'm 100% willing to. Because we're the safe space for our students. We're the ones that they can come to to talk to when they have questions. And they know that. So I think that this is the place where these conversations should be had. Uh, yeah. So those were the three weeks that I thought were the most important in my mind um, when it comes to new teachers and bringing things into a classroom. Because to me, as a teacher, I want to be a safe space for my students. I want to encourage them to do their best, to try their best, and I want to be there to help them achieve their goals, their dreams. I want to be able to make the next generation better than ours in terms of self-esteem, in terms of their views. I want to preach acceptance and preach that if you try hard, you can achieve what you want, no matter what other people say. Um, and I think as educators, that is our job. It's our job to help these students reach their goals, to be the best person they can be. So, yeah, that's what I took away from this course. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, there are things that I'm taking away with me. And there are things that are going to follow me into my classrooms, wherever I end up. Um, and that knowledge, that background, having that knowledge of everyone's different backgrounds and all of this is definitely going to help me be the best teacher I can be. So thank you, Vince, for an incredible semester, even though it was cut short by Corona. Um, yeah, thanks.